Hi there, welcome to some tech tutorials on chapter 10, where we look a little closer at the relationship between risk and return, and how holding a portfolio of more than one asset, uh, the risk and return of that portfolio will change as the composition of the portfolio changes. And by composition, I mean the percentage of your funds that are held in each stock. So to start off here, I've got a portfolio of two companies, TJ Maxx and ExxonMobil. So TJX is the ticker symbol for the TJ Maxx group of brands and XOM is ExxonMobil. I also have dates from 2005 to 2014 and corresponding to each of those dates I have the annual returns for both companies. We also have some statistics. We've got the expected returns. Um, it's the historical averages, but when we're taking on an investment, we often use the historical average to project our future expected return. So we would then say that we use the average function, looking at TJ Maxx's historical returns, to say that we would expect them to have, on average, an annual return of 23.3% looking into the future. ExxonMobil has an expected return of 11.9%. So we can see that what the relationship that we would expect between risk and return. We take on extra risk. You can notice the higher variance of TJ Maxx compared to that of ExxonMobil and the higher standard deviation of TJ Maxx in comparison to ExxonMobil. And that extra level of risk brings us a higher level of expected return. Right, that's great. So we see that sort of golden rule of risk and return where in order to get a higher return, we need to take on extra risk. Uh, or conversely, you could say that investors are only willing to take on extra risk if they have a higher expected return. So like all stocks, these two stocks don't move together perfectly. We see, in fact, that they, all, that they have an inverse relationship. They're negatively correlated. So in years when ExxonMobil does really, really well, TJ Maxx doesn't do so well, and vice versa. So let's start by putting together a portfolio of these two stocks, knowing that we're going to have some benefits from diversification, reducing our risk. So let's start with a portfolio combination that's 50% TJ Maxx and one minus 50% of ExxonMobil. This is a really important thing to have where the first stock is 50% or some given percent and the other stock is going to have one minus that. What that does is it just ensures that as you change the percentages in the first stock, it automatically updates the weight of the second stock. And we need to have that. That needs to be in place for the rest of this example to work. So before you move on, you're going to always at least want to make sure that, that if you change your first stock's composition, the second one will change as well. So let's see what a portfolio of these stocks, a combination of these two, returned in the past and what we might expect it to return in the future. There's another tutorial in Chapter 9 on how to do this, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. So in 2014, 50% of our portfolio returned 28%, and we add that to the other 50% of our portfolio that yielded 5.23%. So that means in 2014, last year, or this year, the year ending today, we would have had dollar, 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 dollar returns. And by doing a little formatting, we can change to see that that is hmm, 69.4. I made a mistake. Ah, that's supposed to be a multiplication signal. You guys all were seeing that, saying, oh, she screwed up, she screwed up. Okay. Let's make some changes here. I'm going to drag that down. Okay, awesome. So within the last year, the year that ended January 2nd, 2014, that year would have brought us a 16.8% increase in the value of our investments, and so these would have been our returns. So if we average those, we could say that our, if we were to make a portfolio investment in the future in these two companies, we would expect our portfolio to have an average return of 17.6% we would expect our portfolio to have a variance, a measure of risk, of 2.5%, and we would expect a standard deviation of 15.9%. So this is 
still a very risky portfolio, right? And so let's take a look at a couple of different portfolios. And in our mind here, we're going to stick to that golden rule of investing where we would expect that taking an extra risk is going to bring us extra reward. So let's look at a couple different portfolios. Let's look at first a portfolio where we have 25% in TJ Maxx, 75% in ExxonMobil. And then let's look at one where we've got 50-50. And then look, let's look at one where we've got 75% in TJ Maxx and 25% in ExxonMobil. I already have my chart set up so that you don't have to deal with me formatting. But on the y-axis, we have expected return. And on the x-axis, we have standard deviation. What I want the portfolio to look like at first is a scatter plot, just a marked scatter with no lines. It'll give you an idea for where we're going. So let's take this number here and let's change our investment in TJ Maxx to 25%. Automatically, ExxonMobil changes to 75%. So if we've got 25% in TJ Maxx, we think that our portfolio is going to have a standard deviation of 11.3% and expected return of 14.8%. I just got those numbers here. And when I type those numbers in, because I already have it set up, you aren't going to need to do this. I just want to illustrate the point. This marker shows up. This marker shows that this particular point represents a portfolio with a standard deviation of 11.3 and an expected return of 14.8. Okay? So what if we have a 50-50 portfolio? 50% TJ Maxx, 50% ExxonMobil. Well, our expected return increases to 17.6% and our standard deviation increases to 15.9%. That's what we might expect, that we get a higher return, but with it, we get a broader distribution, so we've got less certainty. Let's take one more example where we have 75% in TJ Maxx and the 25 per remaining percent is in ExxonMobil. Well, in this case, our standard deviation is a whopping 24% for a re expected level of return of 20.5%. Here is that third point. And we see with each of these portfolios, as we change the composition, meaning the percentage invested in each stock, we change the risk reward profile. And for each of these profiles or each of these portfolios, we see that we can receive increased return only if we're willing to take on increased risk. So the greater our return, the greater the risk with every portfolio, at least of these three. <laughs> because as we'll see, not all portfolios are going to adhere to this golden rule of risk and return. And those that don't adhere to that rule, uh, for instance, a portfolio where you might see a lower expected return and a higher level of risk, we're not even going to consider those as portfolios to invest in. So there aren't a lot of things we know for sure about investing, but we do know that we're not going to take on extra risk for lower return. So at least we can eliminate some things. So where I'm going to go from here is I'm going to clear this out. And instead of just looking at three portfolios, we're going to look at 10 combinations of portfolios. And we're going to use a data table to make this a lot easier for ourselves. So to start my data table, we're going to look at standard deviation. I've typed in, you just can't tell yet. And then I'm going to do expected return as my other cell. And I'm going to take a look at those and see how they vary as the percentage invested in TJ Maxx varies. So let's start with 0% and go up in 10% intervals all the way to 100%. All right. So I'm going to use the data table function to see how risk and return varies as a function of percentage invested in TJ Maxx. So in this case, I don't have a row input cell. My input is my column, and the input that I'm interested in is the percentage invested in TJ Maxx. So it pops up, our graph pops up. Let's change this briefly. I'm going to change it to a smoothed marked scatter. It makes it a little 
more obvious. So when you do this, for your plot, you're going to need to decide how to format your axes. You'll have expected return on the Y, standard deviation on the X, and you will want to format your axis so that your minimum values and your maximum values correspond to your minimum values and your maximum values for your standard deviation and expected return so that you can really see this whole shape so that it takes up most of your graph. All right, so what do we see here? We see a plot that shows a variety of different portfolio combinations and the expected return and standard deviation of each combination. I'm going to check my time to see if I need to record another tutorial. Okay, so what we're going to do is stop this here and do another tutorial that explains this relationship and lets us know some important things about it. All right, thanks for watching. See you in the second tutorial for Chapter 10.